You're listening to the Racer to Racer podcast presented by Race 92. Race 92 is a vintage-inspired racing apparel brand specializing in celebrating vintage race culture and adapting to motorsports today. Check out race92.com for all your racing merchandise needs. I'm Aaron McAtee, your co-host, the other co-host you may have seen walking out of a great clips with a big old smile on his face. Hmm. You've probably seen him at a dirt track. He is the one and only Scott Bowie. Scott Bowie, Hello, what is going on? How you doing, bud? I am doing great. So this show, we're doing something a little different. Um, normally we have, you know, an, a big interview, um, long interview. This one, obviously this week, we're leading up to the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona. So th- we thought we would do something a little different. Um, and it's not really, first we kind of called it a preview show, but it's really not. It's more of a tribute show to the 2022 rolex 24 hours of daytona race um so what we decided to do was to have two of our former guests both um had you know very successful sports car careers and they both have driven in the rolex 24 hours of daytona and we wanted to get a more current guy and you know an older guy who's raced you know back in 80s and 90s um and that's what we were able to do so um the first segment is going to be me mogetley and then the second segment is going to be pete halsmer and pete Drove not only in a couple Indy 500s, he drove in IMSA for a while, won a lot of races. Um, he drove in Trans Am. He actually won Rolex 20, well, wasn't called the Rolex back then, but he won the 24 hours at Daytona in his class three times. Um, so, yeah, what a better guy to talk to than that. I mean, no, no one else I can really think of. Great guy. Always great yeah. to talk to. Yeah, he is. He, he's a great guy. He's funny. He's nice. Yeah. And uh, Aaron, you can uh, you can be the person who can say that you got Pete to use Zoom on his phone with uh, the help for the first time. I will say with the help of a kitchen sponge. With the help of a kitchen sponge, the kitchen sponge is hidden, uh, but it is there, holding up his phone. Uh, no, Pete was a, a he is a very nice man, very kind with his time, funny. Um, and a champion. And we found out that and this is something I didn't realize. I I I don't know what I was thinking. 24 hours Daytona, he he wasn't getting Rolex watches when he won. Because I asked him about his Rolex watch and he said, Well, I didn't get one. It wasn't sponsored yeah, by it Rolex. It wasn't sponsored, then. that's right. And um, uh and I think Aaron's right. I think Rolex needs to go back and hand out watches to everyone who won the race before. Uh, they sponsored it. I mean, I realize it's their money and all that, but come on. It's just some watches, right? Just some watches. <laughs> but, yeah, there'd be a lot because I mean, you're talking about all the different classes and oh, yeah. two or three drivers per, per car. That'd be pretty crazy. Um, but, you know, and Mimo was also always a pleasure to talk to Mimo. Great guy. Um, and he's still actively racing, and um, he's looking for an opportunity to run in the 24 Hours of Daytona this year. He's going to be there. The weekend before, during the Roar, racing in the Prototype Challenge, um, which is what we learned is the LMP3 cars. So it's basically the same cars they race in the Rolex, but they're in their own series, um, and he's racing that. So great exposure for him, I think. Um, I think a lot of teams will know he's still around. He has experience racing in the bigger series. So um, I know with like COVID and everything, he said that you know there could be some openings. So hopefully something works out for him, and he's able – to get back into the Rolex 24. Um, and unfortunately for him, <clears throat> I forget the exact year, but he had a very bad wreck um, at least five or six years ago, right? Um, during the Rolex 24. So I'm sure, you know, <clears throat> part of him wants to come back and do that race kind of as a, I don't know, um, what, whatever you call it, like a, uh, what do you call it? Someone comes back to prove themselves a, um, I just redemption it. redemption just thank redeemed. you yeah, yeah like a redemption um so you know he can go out you know on top of that race and um you know being able to finish it i'm sure that's something he wants to do and you know mimo's a great guy so i definitely hope you know see see him run, running in that race but i think regardless he's gonna have a blast run in the prototype challenge and hopefully you know he can bring home a bring home a win yeah hopefully he can <laughs> he uh um yeah, he was getting prepared for it. And he'd been out running carts. Um, <laughs> he was in, he was sitting in a, the garage where the carts were uh, when he did the interview with us. It, they just wrapped up. 
And uh, so, uh, yeah, best best of luck to to Mimo. And I'm, I'm with you. I'd like to see him get a chance in the 24 hours. It, it, too bad it come, would come at the expense of someone else. But right. yeah, that's the only thing. It, you know, hopefully, hopefully, if need be, you know, he he is the person chosen, and then hopefully, he can have a good run. And I mean, this past year, he he has been racing. Um, he r- raced in, I think it was like the basically like the World Challenge, um, the series that ever replaced that. And he won at least. I know one race. So I mean, he's still very competitive. He still stays extremely active with obviously go karts. Which, like you said in the interview, he's in the go kart garage and the go kart sitting behind him. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, it was real cool. And, and uh, yeah, I just I mean both guests. Yeah. Again kind with their time funny nice um i've really enjoyed getting to talk to him on the show and and uh, i wish me all the best and uh and i'm sure we'll be talking to pete again oh yeah he just turned into as you would say a friend of the show he is a friend of the show pete hall's we may have to have him back on for like we do something for the 500 absolutely he'd, he'd be really good for that but we're going to get him a phone stand right that's right. He'll have a phone stand next time. Well, um, yeah, no, I don't think we really have anything else to say, but um, I just hope everyone enjoys. You don't we didn't want to go too long with this intro. Um, and we do have some other really great episodes coming out. Um, so yeah, and we um yeah, we're always trying to come up with new things and um we're working on some other guests as well, some other really great people, and we definitely look forward to those as well. And thanks everyone for watching on YouTube and listening on apple podcast spotify if you haven't already if you're watching on youtube hit like hit subscribe and also follow us on other podcast platforms and we really appreciate everyone listening and watching yes please do and and that number just keeps going up and we absolutely appreciate it i think we're gonna have to like i don't know when we get to a certain number scott bowie is going to do something i don't know what yet Man, it's just, um, so I, I know we talked about this during the Chili Bowl live stream where you said, why does it have to be me? Well, that's what everyone I mean, wants, maybe, Scott. So you got to take maybe, one for the team. Maybe if we get to 250, I'll start getting my life together. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's a good thing. Scott Bauer. That, it would probably make together. a lot of my family members happy. I can tell you that. All right. Well, we hit 250 on YouTube. Scott Bauer is going to get his life together. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 300 we're running through the brick wall for antron yeah i don't know if i'm a brick wall uh a little brick wall runner guy but uh i would knock down the proverbial brick wall for him for sure absolutely well um like i said i hope everyone has a great week enjoy the rolex 24 hours at daytona and um yeah thanks everyone for watching and listening and we'll see you soon thanks everybody have a great week we are joined today by one of our former guests, former Grand Am driver and 24 Hours of Daytona competitor. He is also racing with AL Autosport with JDC Motorsports in IMSA's Prototype Challenge Series on Saturday, January 22nd at Daytona International Speedway. We are joined by Mimo Gitley again. Hey, Mimo. Um, it's always hey. a pleasure to have you on. How's Thanks. it going today? Obviously, we got the go-kart, the go-kart behind you, so you've been doing some go-karting today? Yeah, I tried to squeeze myself in the shop best I could. But, yeah, I'm just at the uh, Sonoma Raceway right now. I'm here a lot. But just doing some karting and just loaded everything back in and and uh, just sit down to give you guys a call. But, yeah, up here at Sonoma Raceway right now. Yeah, well, we always appreciate um, our interview with you that we did a couple – I think it was a couple months ago now. It was one of my favorites, and I think Scott would definitely agree with that. Definitely um, oh, really cool to have you back on. So we always appreciate you answering my email. Sure. Um, so obviously you're you're doing go-karts, staying um staying physically fit and ready for this upcoming weekend. So you're actually racing in the um IMSA prototype challenge series at Daytona International Speedway during the roar. Um so that's pretty cool. So talk a little bit about how how that came about. Well, I guess it was about a week ago. Um I got a call from um somebody who's part of that program. And Scott Wheeler, who's part of that program, puts it all together. And they had, it's a two driver. And so they were all set to go, but they were waiting to get, um, they need to get, of course, you need to get your approval for your licensing. And one of the drivers wasn't able to get uh, license approval. So very last minute, they, you know, they already had the car, the team, 
everything was there ready to run or, you know, would be there ready to run. And they just needed, uh, needed a driver. And <laughs> so, uh, so they gave me a call and asked if I was interested and if I was available. And, and of course I was, and, and that's how it all started. So the, the cars, the, um, you, you race in that. So it's just an LMP three car, right? So is that the same car that's in the regular, like IMSA 24 hours of Daytona? It is, but you know, the LMP threes have only recently been allowed in the 24 hours of Daytona. Right. I raced LMP three a couple few years ago. Then there still is a sprint series that, that, that runs nationwide and it's very good. Like we had hmm, 25 cars or something like that. So big fields. Um, and so IMSA, uh, wanted to also offer like an endurance series that, that runs as well. So yeah, you can take the LMP3 cars and you can race Daytona and Sebring and uh, a couple of the other long distance races, or you can um, continue to do the sprint races, which are mostly hour and 45 minutes. And then there's a couple long distance ones like Daytona, which is three hours. Right. So, um, so obviously you've um, done, how many times have you done 24 hours of Daytona now? Oh, I would say probably at least uh, seven times, maybe eight, something like that. Yeah, that's um, that's a, that's a lot of races for sure. So yeah. what um, what so your was was twenty four hours at Daytona your first ever like twenty four hour race, or did you do a twenty four hour race before that? You know, I believe that was probably. My first, I mean, other than like out here, there's a big race called the 25 Hours of Thunder Hill. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And it's a 25 hour race and it's a more of an amateur race per se, like all the really fast and even hired pros that are, are hired to come out and do the race. But so I may have done, I did do that a couple of times, maybe once or twice, but yeah, Daytona 24 was definitely my first sort of pro, like, uh, you know, 24 hour race. Right. And what, I guess, what, um, what's the challenges of a 24 hour race compared to a normal race? So I got a phone call from Pete. I talked to Pete Hallsmer on the phone. I don't know last week because we're actually going to do it, an interview with him as well and kind of piece it together in this for our preview, um, podcast for the Rolex 24. And he was saying he was never a fan of the 24 hour races and it was just, you know, grueling. And, um, I mean, just obviously a lot of work. Um, what, what was your kind of thought on the 24 hour races? I mean, was that something you enjoyed or was it just too much? You know, it is grueling for sure. Um, mm -hmm. many sides of it from a driver, it's, it's grueling because you're, you know, you're in the car, you're out of the car trying to get sleep and then knock on the door middle of the night a couple times. And so it is grueling. I mean, I think the thing about grueling races is if you do do well, you do win, it's really you know, makes it like that much sort of more meaningful or special. So, um, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of sprint races, you know, boom, 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 you know, get out there, bang some bars and, and get it done and, and be done with it. So it's definitely a different mentality, but it's, uh, I, I like the challenge of the 24 hour races. I like the challenge of, of, uh, being out there, you know, um, like I said, the, the wake up call at three in the morning, to jump into a car and go sometimes you're like oh geez but uh, <laughs> if you can do well then it's 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 a great race to be in how much sleep do you actually get during that i mean did you do you sleep at all sometimes it for sure like when i first did my first 24-hour race out at daytona i was just so uh, ex you know i was excited to be there just like any race and so i would when i'd get out of uh out of the car I would just hang out in the pits and watch times, and, you know, see what was going on and things like that. And that was a big mistake, um, or at least a mistake, something that I learned. It's like now my whole deal was probably after the first year, it was like after I get out of the car, I'm like punching out. It's like punching out of the clock and I'm done, you know. And so I'm just like checked out, gone and go back to the RV or wherever we're staying at. And uh, don't turn on the TV, don't watch it on, you know, results wherever you can see them. I would just have a little snack, you know, try and relax, get some sleep. Sometimes that worked and sometimes it didn't. But even not sleeping, uh, if I couldn't actually sleep, you know, just closing your eyes and just sort of sitting there motionless, 
is not as good as sleep, but it's at least helps you a little bit. So it's kind of 50, 50 on sleep. What's the, um, is there any way to train your body for that? Like, can you say for a, a month before the race, start training your sleep cycle or is there just no way to do that? You know, you probably could. Uh, I never, never thought about doing that. Um, but it's, you know, the only, the problem with that is it's like, you know, leading up to the race or any race, it's like your, your training program and just what you're, what you're, uh, you know, trying to get ready for it. It's, it's kind of like you want full power and you want to be, you know, as strong as you can. So if you're sort of sleeping, waking up in the middle of the night, trying to go back to sleep and, and, you know, putting in workouts and all that along with it, then I, 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 for me, it's just like being in the best physical and rested shape I can be in. That's what I'm trying to do. Right. I don't like pit fit training. They do. Um, and I'm sure there's other training stuff out there as well, but they, they do a lot of the training where, um, they tire your body down. They, they do the stuff where you have to like, um, use your brain to, for reaction times and stuff. So I'm sure that stuff is very beneficial for a, a grueling race like that. I think it's, yeah, I mean, just being in the best physical, mental, just the best shape you can be in is going to help you because it's not going to be, it's not going to strain your body as much. Right. Is there a part of um, Daytona, is there a part of the track, especially in, in the, in, when you get into the nighttime and you're running with the lights on and, and of course, I think it's better lit today than it used to be, but uh is there a part of the track that can just kind of lull you to sleep in the, in the middle of the night and in, in a way of, you know, like if you just aren't completely on top of your game, it can really trick you into making a mistake. Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, it's got some areas, the track for sure. Like when you're on the banking, you're flat out a long part of the track and uh, there's not a lot of, you're not doing much. You're just, like driving on the freeway <laughs> kind of right that would be the place but i never i never felt like that the only time i did feel like that is once i was there and there was a uh, fog rolled in and so they immediately went to a full course yellow and it was like hey, i got to think it was like five in the morning you know sort of before the sun was up four in the morning and the the fog yellow flag was for about an hour and a half and uh, i was definitely wanting to fall asleep right then. right when you're out there racing it's just you got the adrenaline and you've got stuff coming at you and uh i never really felt tired when i'm out there actually on the track right now for i mean a race like that a 24-hour race obviously there's two or three other drivers that are also you know kind of in the race with you does that give you more pressure to, I don't know, like if, if you mess up, you, you mess up the race for, you know, all the other drivers. And I mean, really that's endurance racing in itself. And um, I guess you're good to kind of answer this because you have experience with single seaters and where you're the only driver. So how, how does that compare with endurance racing? I mean, do you feel more pressure because there's other people that you can mess up the race for? There's a lot of pressure. Yeah. I mean, not just your driver, but the crew, right. Yeah, I mean, like the prep that goes into prepping a race car and mm -hmm. that one event to get ready for that one event is like massive. I mean, it's sure. huge, you know. So, um, you know, you're just you're just a, a part of of what's going to happen out there, and you definitely don't want to be, uh, you know, don't want to make a mistake and uh, cost you know a result for you or every anybody else that's worked so hard in the team. So. Definitely, there's there's definitely a lot of pressure. <laughs> when when you get up on the bank, you know you transition up on the bank, and then you go through the bus stop, or you want to call down the back straightaway, and then you get back up on the bank. Is it, that initial transition to the bank is that pretty abrupt, or is that fairly fairly easy to to get into? It's fairly easy. Um, it's, you know, I've been on some, uh, rollables where you go onto the banking and it's like, you know, you swear you're going to grind the bottom of the car off, but the transition from Daytona 
you know, turn six is where you first kind of clock onto the turn one, turn two area or get up on it. And it's not really an issue there. Um, and then the other part is you come off it on the bus stop chicane and then you come back on it at that point. So um, the transition is, is, is really smooth. But you don't realize how steep the banking is, you know, when you're at speed because it feels not flat, but it, it's just uh, feels like, uh, you know, there's no, it just doesn't feel like it as much banking as it is. But when you, when you do have a yellow flag around there <clears throat> and you're going slowly on the banking and you can't hold your head up because there's so much banking, it's like leaning off to the side. It's definitely like lots. I don't know what the number is. What is it? 30 degrees? I don't know what it is, but there's a I don't remember now. It's something like that. Yeah. I had yeah. a I had a friend who uh raced at Winchester one time and Salem and Winchester, uh the half miles here in Indiana, massive banking to them. And uh I mean very similar to Daytona. And uh he was running his midget there. And his wife was like, why didn't you get up on the banking further? So after the race, that was back when people really don't do it today, but it was back when he had an open trailer in his van. He just said, okay. So he took his, so we were, we were leaving. He took the van, drove it up on the bank and he got her about a quarter way up the track. And she goes, oh, this is really steep. He goes, yeah, you want me to go any further? And she's like, no, I'm okay. And <laughs> people don't realize, you know, when you're running that slow, what that feels like. And you, you know, and of course when he's running a midget, he's obviously running faster, but still that's a lot of banking up there. It's a lot. Like I said, that, that most, one of the most, when I felt the most was any yellow flags you do, but that one time when it was a full course yellow for an hour and a half. And so we were going 60 miles an hour around the bank. <laughs> Literally my head is like down the opposite way. Like, oh, wow. oh Jesus, where's my pillow? You know? So it's, <laughs> A lot of banking for sure. And um, Daytona, I mean, it's it's a lot different than the other tracks you race at. Because I don't even know, what would you call, I mean, it's, I guess there's a road course, but it's almost like the Roval or something, right? I don't even know what, I mean, I guess they just call it a road course. But I mean, is it banking the, the big difference, like as far as like that track compared to the other tracks? I mean, is it pretty similar as far, or I guess what's the difference with having an oval um, converted into a road course first? an actual road course, if that makes sense. Probably just the banking, right? Yeah, the banking and just, uh, you know, I mean, some track, it's, there's definitely, there's a, you know, some some ovals, uh, I'm trying to think which ones, but, you know, they sort of put a couple little turns in the infield and then back out on the banking, you know, so it's not really much of an infield, but uh, Daytona has a nice infield. You know, they've break, broken it up nicely, yeah. you know. Um, you know, it doesn't feel like you're, like on an oval with a couple corners thrown in, it actually feels like you're on a, a racetrack, you know, one that was built for that. So, um, you know, it's, it's nice the way it's, the way it's laid out. Yeah. It's, it's, it's so hard to build a road course inside a, cause they say, well, look how big this facility is, but you don't realize people don't realize when you start building a road course, road courses can be massive. I mean, you know, they can be yeah. so long. So if yeah. you try to build something, you got to be really careful, I would think, trying to build something inside the, there because then it becomes so technical because it's so tight that, uh, yeah, so I, I would, I mean, obviously I've never run there, but I think the Indianapolis Motor Speedway's got a pretty good road course. Um, right. And I think Daytona's got one too. Yeah, Indianapolis, yeah, this is the first time I was there. It was last year in the okay. TO, uh, Motorsports Bentley. Uh, the GT3 car that I raced last year. And uh, that was the first time I'd been on the, the Indy road course. And that is definitely a pretty sweet road course. Like the corners definitely feel like uh, a road course, you know, like just how wide they are and the curbing and all that sort of thing. And um, um, Daytona is kind of similar in that sense, even though it's been there a long time. And, uh, um, but definitely some ovals with infields. We used to race at Phoenix. And they have yeah. their prototypes. We had Phoenix, like the Roval there, the oval with the road course. And it was kind of just like, you know, a few corners thrown in and then back out, you know? So, um, and then I've used to, I mean, I remember when I first started and raced Shelby Can-Am, we went to Charlotte 
and we ran uh, there during one of the big races and one of the NASCAR races. And so they just threw in like a chicane, sort of down the oval and then back up on it. And then, so it was definitely like an afterthought, you know? Um, so yeah, Daytona is, is nice from that standpoint. The track like Indy is also very nice from that, that standpoint too. Yeah. When you did the yeah, um, from the ones I've seen, that it, I would agree with you. I'm sorry, go ahead there. Oh no, you're good. Yeah. I was going to say like when, when you raced in every year, you did the Rolex 24. You were in the like the LMP one, and I don't know if they. Um, I'm so sorry. So in Grand Am, it was still called LMP one, right? That's been so no. long. Yeah, it was called Daytona Prototypes. Right, you were always in that category, right? Yeah, okay. they had, uh, I was there. Actually, I was there. When was it? Was it before that? Yeah, actually, I was there when it was when it was before Grand Am. It was IMSA, not IMSA. What was it before Grand Am? Where oh, the man. you know the sort of the uh, hmm. you know the other you know ALMS type car. Oh, like ALMS. Yeah, I wonder if it was. Yeah, ALMS. maybe is ALMS. I don't remember what it was yeah. called. I did race there once in a like a Lola Judd or something like that. With uh, Stefan Johansson's team, it was Stefan Johansson's team. I don't remember. It's been a long time ago, but pretty much all the other times, and just about every time, has been when it was uh, Grand Am and it was the Daytona prototypes. How much? How much more difficult does it make it when there's car, a lot slower cars on the track? Like obviously the lower levels. I mean, does that make it? I'm, I'm guess that would make it harder being in a, you know, a faster car, and I'm sure vice versa. It's the same way if you're in the slower car for lack of a better term it's busy it's definitely busy <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh you know most of my time just about it has been in the faster car mm -hmm. um, and you know we would bitch and complain and you know get teed off when we get held up a little bit and stuff like that but i'll tell you i did do uh like uh, a year in a gt car and when you're in a GT car, not only are you trying to like run on the edge, of course, the limit, drive as fast as you can, but these damn cars are catching up to you and shoving it in on you so quickly. And it's like way harder than, than being the faster car. Being right. slower is way harder than being the faster car. That's for sure. Well, you never have the preferred line. Right? I mean, yeah. I mean, you, you have it maybe for a second and then you know, you, you know, a prototype, which they're going to do because they're faster, shove it in on the inside. And now you're like in outs on the outside in the marbles. And right. you, know, you sort of have to, you know, when you watch like the best GT drivers, they definitely like somehow are able to like, go, okay, take the inside, you know, they sort of like open it up for them and just realize they're going to have to be out in the marbles and gather it up and go. Because as soon as you start being defensive in a GT car, then you're going to get shoved off the track. That's just the way. It is. Yeah. So, but I definitely, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to be in the faster car. <laughs> yeah. You know, that, that's a really great point. I, I, I mean, I've, I guess I've noticed, I just never thought about cause you're, you're running for a class win you're, as you as well. So you're chasing the guys in front of you, or if you're not the leader of that class. So then you, you're all not only fighting your guy, but then you're having the, you know, worry about being in the faster car's way. That's a really interesting dynamic I never really thought about. Yeah, it's, it's you know, like if you ever, if you've ever raced or anybody's ever raced that it's listening to this and, and or driven on a track and someone makes a last minute pass on them, pass on them going into a corner and they have to like, you know, there's, they have to recover from being shoved out wide. Well, if you're in a GT car, that's happening like all the time. You know, so uh, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's difficult. Wow. I never thought of that. I know yeah. the big, the big thing I heard them talking about on the broadcast last year with the introduction of the M LMP3 cars is they were, I mean, they're pretty much, they're competing with the GT cars. Like the speed and everything is pretty similar. Um, well, which is kind of interesting. I mean, you look at LMP3 car and you think that's going to go a lot faster than a GT car, but that's just me. I mean, I don't obviously have a great knowledge of, you know, racing in that regard, but, um, yeah. They're faster. The, the, right. LMP, the LMP3 cars, it depends on the track you're at. 
Mm -hmm. But they're usually at least a couple seconds a lap, two or three seconds a lap faster, whether it's at Sebring or it's at, you know, um, wherever they're, they're a couple seconds. You know, the cool thing about, you know, when you think about it is, you, you know, LMP3, I think they put the cap on like 200,000 is what's maximum that you're allowed to spend on the car. You go buy a new uh, Porsche GT3, you know, 99, uh, whatever the newest one is, you know, you're going to be spending like five or six hundred thousand dollars on it. So, you know, like when you look at like bang for the buck from a lap time standpoint, you know, it's hard to beat an LMP3. Mm, that's why the sure. series, one of the reasons why the series is so successful as well. Basically, you're two to one. It's, yeah, you're, and 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 they are faster. I mean, you know, Aaron. Even though if you look at lap times, they're like, depending on the track, two or three seconds a lap faster. Uh, about the same down the straightaway. Like you know, LMP3 at Daytona is about 180 miles an hour down the straightaway. So similar down the straightaway um, to you know uh, GT3 um, as far as outright top speed, and then definitely a little faster in the corners as well. Even though the GT3s, I mean, they haul through the corners. I mean, they all make great downforce and they have big tires and they're fairly light. But, um, but yeah, it's bang for the buck. It's definitely like, you know, uh, when they introduced the series, they definitely, that was an awesome thing that they did for sure. And just how it's been controlled. So can you take, can you, can you take a moral victory out of one of those deals? Um, I know everybody, you know, Seconds first, is whatever that somebody wants to say, but when it's um, when it's you know when you guys have overcome and, and maybe you you had problems and you run say fourth in that race, can you take moral victories out of that deal? Uh yeah, you like to think so, right? <laughs> right. I mean, it's you know, I mean, all you can do you know in that race is you can just get out there and, and just do the best you can. And not only like when you're out there at the racetrack, but also like leading up to it. I mean, Daytona is a grueling race. 24 hour Daytona is a grueling race. And so there's, you know, it's the off season kind of, you know, uh, November, yeah. December, right. That's usually the off season, but you know, like, uh, I mean, I was, and still am, but I mean, for 24 hour racing, you need to be hitting it hard you need to be doing everything you can to be in like top shape there's no real rest time before you start the normal season so um uh, you, you, yeah you gotta hit it hard for sure right so we were talking a little bit about this before we actually started the introduction but so th th this upcoming weekend you're you're driving in the imsa um prototype challenge so talk a little bit about what what you want to get from that and i'm i mean obviously you want to win um but also we're talking a little bit about how the rolex 24 is coming up the week after and your goal obviously is to also to get a right for that um so i'm guessing the prototype challenge is a good um i don't know a good way to show people you're still around and you're still competitive right yeah it's great to get out there i mean really that's my number one thing uh you know the only thing i'm really focusing on is just basically to go out there and and uh, give these guys a great result and and help them. They're a new, you know, JDC has been around for a long time, very successful. Actually, you know, I've known John for in racing a long time. They started with nothing and now very successful. But as far as like the, you know, the uh, my car that I'm in, that's a new new car in the JDC sort of team. So uh, new sponsor, new drivers. So I, you know, I just want to give them as, as much as I can, you know, like to show them, pass on, whatever, help them and just do that, you know? And then, you know, it's like anything, you never know what's around the corner. And, uh, um, but I don't really have any goals on anything else other than right now, just to do, just to, just to get out there and do, do what I can do and help them in, in the LMP3 prototype challenge. So for something like that, I mean, do you just make yourself kind of visible like during the roar and stuff so people know you're there and you're available or how does that work? Yeah, it's always nice to do that. I mean, I know so many people that are there, but, you know, see somebody for a year, they may think that you're off doing something else or you're just not interested in getting out right. of the track or, 
So it's nice for them to see you physically make eye contact with you and see see what you look like, see what they think think about you. So definitely uh, helps to be there for sure. Do you got any sponsors you'd like to you'd like to plug in this deal? Oh, you know the the um, uh, you know AL uh, Autosport, right? Autosport, AL Autosport. Uh, it's all very really new to me, but they're a new team, you know, as far as that are running this LMP3 or new, you know, side of it to the LMP3. So, um, you know, they're, they, they, uh, you know, deserve the uh, credit for getting out there and doing it. You know, I think it's great. I think um, Alex, who's the owner of, of this car and this program, um, who was actually slated to drive and couldn't. He's really excited. He's a he's a new guy into it. He's done some racing in other series, um, I think for a challenge or something like that. So, and he just wants to get into the big show. So, um, I think it's great. You know, Alex is going to be out there, uh, and my teammate Alexander, of course, in the car. And uh, neither of them have been to Daytona, I think, before. My teammate hasn't driven on the track before, and so it's just like it's a great way to get in the big. Sh- to be feeling like you're part of the big show, which they are. And uh, so, you know, definitely my hat's off to them and, and I'm stoked to be out there and get in the car and work with JDC and just go have some fun, do well and have some fun. That sounds great. Well, I wish you all the best. I, I wish you, uh, what do you guys get for winning that? What is there? What, what do they have? I don't know. <laughs> I think a trophy. <laughs> It's not a Rolex. I didn't, not it's a Rolex. I didn't know if they had the plaques or if they had plaques or trophies or. They usually, IMSA has really nice trophies. So they usually have, you know, great trophies. And like I said, it's a competitive series. And there's right. there'll probably be at least 30 cars that are out there. And, um, you know, um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big deal. I think if you're, if you're the overall winner, in this in this three hour race, I think you've done a great you know you've done a great job. Absolutely, sure. absolutely. Well, Mimo, it's always a pleasure talking to you. Um, thanks for coming in again. And uh, man, we sure hope to talk to you again this summer. And thanks a lot. Best of you luck bet. to you. Yeah, yeah. And just uh, it's great to talk to you guys again. But it's just uh, it's cool. Hopefully, you know, my whole deal. One of the things I like to do now is just. You know, it sort of inspires people to get out there and, and yeah. do what they dream about doing. And, uh, you know, I love racing. And uh, it's just like getting out there, being ready. I mean, it's, you know, uh, you know, you just you just wait for these opportunities. And so I just like living the dream now. That's what I'm doing. So uh, living my prime right now. So anyway, just thanks a lot, guys. It's good seeing you. Hey, thank you. And uh, thank you for sharing your prime with us. <laughs> right on. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. All right, thanks. Best of luck. Thanks, Pimo. Thanks. See you guys. Bye. We're joined today by one of our former guests, former IMSA and IndyCar driver. He is a three-time 24 Hours of Daytona class winner. We're joined by Pete Hollismer. Pete, um, it's always great having you on. We really appreciate um, you always taking our call. Oh, thank you, guys. I appreciate it, too. You know, it's uh, been a love of my life to do the racing stuff, and I'm glad to talk to people about it. We did one it three times, and the funny part was, uh, the first time I won it was really only the second or third time that I had gone there, and I and I and I got a ride with a Mazda guy, a guy that was supported by Mazda, but had a small business, Mazda business, Jim Meter, who had a company called Racing Beat, and John Morton, who I had, I had gotten to know that last year or so out in California normally would have driven for him but he had gotten another ride that he thought was a little better deal so he uh, so he recommended me to Jim to drive this Mazda and he drove a Mustang in the in the 24 hour race well John ended up falling out of the race and I ended up winning <laughs> in the ride he should have had <laughs> so it was really kind of interesting but uh, you know that was my first that was my one of my first real rides in somebody else's car that was actually really fairly well engineered. We had, mm-hmm. he was he was a sharp guy, but he did stuff. He didn't have a lot of money. He took us out. We used to go out on a front road frontage road near the highway, 
and he'd have a couple of buddies stand at the end and we'd do performance runs on the car and measure our dynamic loads. And it was like a wind tunnel, but we're using the frontage road parallel to the freeway to do it out in California. <laughs> how um, le- how so legal great. was that? Oh, not so legal. Yes. <laughs> No, we were talking about this a little bit because there was a, on the other, so in our first interview, one of your friends commented on it. I think you said he was your best, best man in your wedding or you were his best man or something. And he said there was some story about your car captain on fire. Um, and I don't, I think you said that wasn't at Daytona, but that was a sports car, right? Well, actually, after you mentioned that, I, I remember back the very first time I went to Daytona, it caught on fire when the engine let go. And, oh. and blew a rod out the side of the block and all the oil and it caught on fire. So it was a fiery exit, but, but it was not a big drama because we're at a track, there's, there's, uh, there's fire support uh, people there, all that kind of thing. So it was not a big deal to get out of the car and not have a problem. But uh, the big fire that I've had in my racing career was at the Baja 500 when I drove a, a, a small Mazda pickup truck in the Baja race. And in the middle of the night, uh, rolled it up in a ball and caught fire out in the middle of nowhere and uh, almost didn't get out of it. I mean, my, my shoe caught underneath the pedal. I couldn't get my feet up on the dash to get the weight off my seat belt to get my belt disconnected. Luckily, I had a buddy that was in the car. It was a two, two people uh, situation that were racing. I was driving. He was a navigator. Luckily. He could get his feet up on the, on the dash upside down and get the weight off his belt and get his belt unlatched. And he got over and helped me get the weight off of me to get out. And I mean, I remember, and it was a, it was a huge fire because it tore the fuel vent off when it rolled and dumped all the fuel out on the ground right underneath the car and caught fire immediately. And I remember, mm. remember taking one breath and thinking, boy, that's the only breath I've got. And I got to get out of here before I breathe again, because it, it was just totally consumed. There was no oxygen in the air. <laughs> and uh, so that was that may be what he was thinking about when he mentioned something about a fire, because that was the big fire that I was. Uh, yeah, I was almost roasted in that. Wow. How many mm. years did you Very do Baja? Lucky. Did you just do Baja one year? Or did you do? I a just did it. That, I just did it that one year Baja. Hmm. Uh, I did a few off-road races uh, with our Sierras because his boys ran off-road cars, and I did the uh, what was it? The Vegas Torino uh, race. Uh, I did a few of those. Did you know? And and I kind of enjoyed it, but I didn't have any experience enough to learn to read the desert. You really had to learn if you had to be around the desert and get to know how to read it, to know what you're coming up on, if you're going to go sure. fast on it. And so that was always a challenge. But but I did get to do the Mickey Thompson series in the off-road trucks for several years with Glenn Harris and the team they prepared for the Mazda people. And that was really fun. We won some races in that, and I really enjoyed that. But that was all in stadiums kind of like the motocross people do and the right. supercross stuff these days. Yeah. That was fun. That was a really interesting challenge. So a yeah, Mickey's son was on here. Yeah. Danny. Yeah. Mickey's son was on here uh, telling us, Danny was telling us about how he, he was running the Baja. His dad was running the Baja. Yeah. And he was navigating. And he said that out of that, he said during the race, he started to start thinking about, hey, I need to be able to bring this to uh, the public. How can I bring this to the public? And he said during the race, oh. he could see his dad's uh, mind, you know, the gears chugging along there. Oh, like that's the where that was the genesis of the of the Mickey Thompson series, yeah. the stadium series, stadium truck series. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I remember Danny coming and running some stuff in uh, Formula Atlantic cars. And uh, then he was trying to do some stuff. He did some stuff for a while. And I, I was so sad to, to see what, what happened with his dad and, and mom. And right. uh, what a crazy deal. But uh, yeah, I remember him being around and doing some stuff. I really never got to know him really at all. But uh, I was always thankful that they created that series. And uh, 
And I always had a lot of respect for Mickey being so creative at the stuff. One of the early races I went to Indy at and saw when I was in high school was when he brought those cars from California with the small wheels. The roller skate? Dave, Mar- Dave, roller skate McDonald, cars? Dave McDonald drove for him and he died in that fiery crash. Yeah. I was there watching that race at the time. I remember seeing that. Yeah, yeah that's what I would have called it. I don't remember. I would have called it a roller skate. <laughs> no, I think that's what they were called, right, Scott? Yeah, that's that, that. I don't know if they were officially called that, but they've always been nicknamed that for sure. Yeah. They were very low and very aerodynamic and had small wheels. I mean, it was really innovative stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was. It was a cool car. So, you yeah. know, we're talking a little bit about like the um, off road racing and like Baja is kind of similar to the Rolex 24 because it's a long race. Um, yeah. yeah. So, talk a little bit about your first your first Rolex 24. Um, because that was that actually your first 24 hour race or did you do 24 hour race before Daytona? The first 24-hour race that I ran it was at Daytona, the 24 hours. I think it was in 80 or 81 uh, while I was just getting into IndyCars cars and, and trying to do as much IMSA stuff as I could for, for, the, for the seat time and the experience. And I went back there with a guy from California, prepared a Ferrari Daytona. And Al Jr. and I were teamed up in it because he and I had been running in the Super V Series competing with each other. And we got hooked up with the same guy. And that was the car that I ended up uh, dropping out in the first hour and, and I had a little fiery exit. But uh, yeah, it was it was like the next couple of races I went back there looking for rides. And I think maybe the next one that I ran was in 83 that I won that, that John Morton recommended me to uh, Jim Meter to run his car for him. And, uh, and we ended up winning the race. Yeah. What, um, so how, how much, so your first 24 hour race, how much sleep? So we just had Mimo Gilly on and we asked him the same question. Like how much sleep did you actually get during those races? Well, you don't really get, I don't know that you can. I, some people may be able to sleep and, and you probably get some sleep late in the race, you know, maybe mm-hmm. in the morning. If you've got, if you've got a situation where you've got enough time, because when you come back, you got a deep brief and talk to the people and help them understand what's going on and give them any input about how the car is. So you lose half an hour, 45 minutes getting back and actually getting to a point where you could actually doze off if you have a chance. But then, but then you also have to be ready like an hour, or an hour and a half before your next stint starts. You have to be ready in case that car comes in early and has to take advantage of a yellow or something. So you really don't have a lot of time. But what I found and what I thought about early on, I was probably pretty lucky I thought of this. I just paid attention to making sure I lay down and close my eyes. And I found that that had gave you a lot of rest and recovery. And your eyes are one of the things that get tired fast. You know, I, I think that uses, uses up a lot of your focus and your mental energy. And if you can just rest your eyes anytime you have out off the track that you can just lay down, even if you're behind the pits and you can't have time to go back to the to the motorhome or something like that. And you just lay down on the ground on your coat and uh, and close your eyes for half an hour, an hour. Even if you still hear stuff, you can't sleep. But that gives you some rest. And that really helped me over years. That was one of the things that helped me be fresher late in the race, I thought. That's really interesting. And how many co-drivers did you guys have back then? Early on, it was two. Then, then for the entire twenty-four hour race. Oh yeah, yeah. And sometimes when you had, sometimes when you had three guys, even later when we're into the faster cars, and and it's more stressful, and the cars are harder on you uh, because they make a little downforce, and the tires are getting grippier. And the race is getting more competitive as the cars become more reliable. You could run closer to qualifying times. Over the years, early on, you couldn't do that because the cars wouldn't hold up. But as you went along, the cars held up better. So you had to run them because it was competitive. You know, whoever could run the quickest, if their car is going to hold up, they're going to run fast laps and you'd be able better be able to do it too. <laughs> and so uh 
so so that was that was some of the challenge. But yeah, we did it with two car, two drivers. But even in the middle years, things happened. We had a race, I think it was with Roush, yeah, when we had three drivers in the GTO car and one of the guys got sick and he just wasn't able to go. He he really couldn't, he just really we basically ran a two two person race and I ended up running like 14 or 15 hours of the 24 hours. Wow. But that's just, that's the stuff that goes on. You know, people don't see that kind of stuff that usually in those races, the, and even in short races in IndyCar and that stuff, there's stuff going on that people don't realize that you're trying to deal with. And there's hardly ever a perfect car and a perfect race where everything went fine for you. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do you, but, yeah. do you, you know, fitness is so different today. Did you do a lot of cardio and and some yeah uh, well like, I played, what we what what they would call circuit training today like cardio and lift a little weights and well stuff I like did that. I played a lot of sports and when I was growing up and I always enjoyed it and I knew and I knew as I started racing I could see it was physical and it was getting more physical as the cars developed downforce and all that kind of stuff and so I knew the key was and I read as much as I could, but I knew you had to find ways to do better in any area you could find that would make you better than the other guys. And it was, and I did a lot of training um, with my eyes, uh, not just cardio and weight work, but neck exercises. I built a neck exerciser, all that kind of stuff. As you've got into downforce cars, like the small formula cars with wings and stuff, you know, it started using up your neck and then you start running on ovals. And <laughs> I, remember, I remember the first time I couldn't, the first time I ran an oval race, the last quarter of the race, I couldn't hold my head up. Ad absolutely physical, physically could not hold my head up. I didn't have a neck strap, any of that stuff. Didn't know about them. And, and, and so I'm driving the last half of the race with left hand and holding my helmet up with my right hand driving around the corners. <laughs> you know, I'm giving up a, a few places, but I'm out there running, but there's no way I could hold my head up. I just, it hurt first. And then it wasn't just pain. You just couldn't physically do it. And so I had to work on neck muscles and, and getting a neck strap and all that stuff. And, you know, well, I, but, I was going to yeah, say a moment ago, Go I was going to say a moment ago, it looks like you, you still got a big neck. Like you like, still have a lot of muscle in you your know, neck area from racing. You know, when I stopped racing, finally, after a year or two, I started getting really bad headaches. And one of the things I went back to, because I suspected maybe, because I had worked a lot on my neck and having accidents with whiplash and neck strains and all that stuff. But I had headaches and I went back to a little exercising my neck. And that, that solved it, you know, just exercising hmm. and stress stretching my neck really helped with that. It was some really bad headaches I was getting. And I, and I suspected it was muscle and arthritis and stuff in my neck because of what I'd done. And I've come across that in other parts of my body as well. But, you know, you learn to pay attention to that stuff from trying to deal with all that in racing in the early and middle years. Yeah. You know, um, that's, a, that's a great point. Yeah. Mimo was kind of saying something similar, right, Scott, yesterday about um, – because there was one 24 he was in, they had like a two-hour caution, so um, they were just go basically going around the oval most of the time for two hours, and he said it was just so hard for him to keep his head up because – and you could probably speak on this better, but like when you go faster, it's easier for your head to – I'm guessing like G-forces kind of keep it, right? Well, what he, what he was saying was is that on that giant banking uh – -huh. You know, you didn't have the G-forces kind of pulling you over, so he was stuck against the car, you know, this way, looking up. Right. Uh, yeah. You look up this way because you that's didn't have the really downforce good, and G-forces. Yeah, that's a really good point, and that's one of the things I remember learning early on is, and it was, and it was a bit dangerous sometimes until you, when you got into the faster cars like the GTO cars and the GTP cars, that stuff. You start going, you start going so fast that you can't look up enough. The top of the windshield doesn't let your visibility look far enough ahead on the track because on the banking, to move to look ahead, you're looking up and to the left. 
and you're looking mm -hmm. up almost more than you are to the left almost. You can't see far enough ahead. And, and just the way the cars were built early on, they didn't recognize early on that that was a problem. And, and your vision was kind of restricted and stuff could happen out there that you couldn't see happening. And by the time it came into your vision because of that top of the windshield restriction, you were on it. Yeah. No, but that I makes can, sense. I understand brother... what he was saying about neck muscles. You never, you're not working the back of your neck muscles to look up as much. Yeah. He right. said he wishes that he had a pillow. <laughs> Which yeah. was going real slow. It would, would have helped him. Or, or the other thing that can happen is, is your neck foam and stuff like that, and the strap that you have, whatever you have to hold you for the right position when you're at speed. Now you slow down and you're going around the bank and real slow where your head's trying to drop down to the left now. You don't have a neck strap or you might not even have a fun foam cushion over there for that. If you're sitting like that for a while, I mean, that wouldn't be so bad because it's, then it's just the heavy, just the weight of your helmet. Mm. But when you're at speed, you know, you're two or three times or four times with the G-loading making your head four times as heavy. And that's the really bad, bad part. Yeah. See, back then, I mean, you guys had like the, did you have the neck rolls or what was it? You didn't really we have used that restraint. stuff. Right. Yeah, we used that stuff. And uh, that helped some before they had the Hans devices that was trying to help, help with whiplash things and that kind of thing and accidents. And then we had a strap to the uh, side of the helmet to keep it from moving, falling over on the ovals. Uh, yeah. Interesting stuff. Oh, for sure. Um, another thing you mentioned, which I didn't even think about when I, we spoke on the phone last week, was about the um, the bus stop ch ch chicane. Obviously, oh, yeah. that wasn't that wasn't there when you raced. I don't even know when when did they the put very, that in? Yeah, I don't early know when that stopped. Something? What's but that? I I would think like early two thousands. I'm not real sure. But what? I it, yeah, I think it was before that. But yeah. but I know when I ran there in the early eighties. It wasn't there for for at least a few of the first races I ran there, one or two of them at least, because I distinctly remember coming down the back straightaway in some in some heavy rain and the mist, and you're going pretty fast without the bus stop by the time you're getting towards the, that banking and three, and uh, and I remember just seeing just seeing a red light, and I and I moved to the right. And immediately I went by this guy about 40 or 50 miles an hour different difference. I mean, oh, wow. he was slowed way down and I had no idea he was going that slow, but I just, I mean, I had just missed to torpedoing that guy going about 50 or 60 miles an hour faster than he was. But mm. uh, yeah, and that was one of the, and, it, and I think they really needed, they, I think they saw the need for a, uh, something to slow things down a little bit because otherwise because we run that stuff in the rain fog everything right. and uh, that really makes it dangerous and they were having tire problems with guys going into the banking that fast on road racing tires that weren't really built for that kind of speed and loading i was gonna say that sounds familiar it sounds like the formula one debacle we had yeah. um you the yeah. u.s grand prix yeah, back in the 2000s. yeah yeah exactly yeah, you never know for sure what things are lurking out there when you try something a little different. Right. But it was really interesting to get to know that kind of a race. Like you, like you mentioned, I had mentioned, I, I first went to an endurance race and I thought, well, I'll do this for seat time and experience and, and to get better at stuff. And I didn't really think of it much as a race because it really is a combination, physical endurance and mental endurance training and experience that you need to learn how to do that kind of thing and minimize mistakes and and maximize your abilities over a long period of time like that mm -hmm. and so it's it's establishing different parameters for how fast and how hard you can run and still still minimize the mistakes and still optimize the speed with which you cover the laps over a long period of time, you know, a number of hours and that kind of thing. How much strategy was involved with like on who was going to start the race and who was going to finish? Like how, was it always like the quicker driver started or how kind of, how did that work? 
it kind of evolved. Usually the quicker driver started the race. The guy mm-hmm. that qualified it usually started it. Uh, but then I think as years went on, I think as the teams, as we had more drivers and the teams uh, and drivers were more experienced and, and you had people on the teams that had time to think about that stuff, um, I think they looked at and talked with the drivers and tried to see where your strong points, saw how fast you could run at night, how consistently you could run at night versus the daytime, how well you ran in the rain, and tried to take all that stuff into account and use that to decide what kind of strategy of timing and who's going to run when and all that kind of stuff. I think that's the smart teams, you know, I'm sure evolved into doing that. It, it, there wasn't much of that in the early years. <laughs> Because it's only two of you. <laughs> but, right, yeah. But uh, but it was interesting to see that evolve. I mean, it became so specialized in the later years, you know, af- after the 80s and, and into the 90s. And, and even the better teams that had good, uh, you know, enough of a funding and had good major sponsors and the car companies involved, uh, they they had the funding to have specialists on the team to think about that stuff and address that stuff. And, uh, yeah. The, um, you know, I was looking a little bit at some of the cars you drove at Daytona and one of the coolest cars that I really like, it's the, um, 87 Ford probe. I had no idea. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. really cool paint scheme. I don't even know what, what was the company app, applic, applicon. Oh, applicon. That was, that was with Roush. When I went to Roush, the first, mm-hmm. the first GTP, GTP cars I drove were for, uh, for BFG Busby, the 962 in 1985. And then after that season, I went to Roush and Ford and initially Ford had a, uh, uh, I uh, deal with uh, Zach Speed, and they were campaigning the probe uh, the, uh, that Zach Speed built and provided the engines for, and Zach Speed ran the team. And then after a year or two, they Ford dropped out of that, and Jack took over running the GTP car for uh, Pruitt and I. And we were in that applicant car which was the next generation of a Ford Probe. It was called a uh, oh, Maxim, M-A-X-I-M. The same guy that designed the Ford Probe designed the Maxim as the next generation. And, uh, and we ran that car sometimes with a V8 in it, sometimes with a turbo four-cylinder in it. And... Uh, and we were reasonably competitive. We were able to run in the top five with that car. It wasn't a, it still was not really a super well-developed and competitive car, but it was a pretty good, pretty good area. But that really wasn't a strong focus of Jack's. Uh, he was kind of doing that, I think, because Ford wanted to or something for a little bit. Mm-hmm. But, but the real deal we were there for was to promote the Mercurs and the Cougars in the GTO and the Trans Am and stuff. So, yeah. What was it hard? Like, I don't know, like going from driving a GT car where you have cars passing you, then going to like a prototype car where you're passing cars. Was that hard? Like getting used to? Uh, it, yeah. And, and it's something you just really fairly quickly, you learned, you really had to pay attention to what the different parameters were. And it really was the GTO cars we're kind of in the worst of all places because you're passing slower cars, the GTU cars, but you're also getting passed. So you're driving out of the mirrors and the front of those cars all the time. And that's really busy. That's really busy work. You talk about wearing yourself out over a 24 hour trying to get rest <laughs> so you can, so you don't get lazy and just don't happen to glance at your mirrors as often as you need to. And boy, bang. You can take somebody out in a hurry doing that, you know. So, so the GTO cars were some of the worst, and and then it also depended on how competitive you were. If you were running at the front of your group, then you didn't have to worry so much. There are a few other cars that you had to be concerned about, maybe in your group that might be uh, able to be coming up on you and passing you or something like that. But uh, if you're running at the front of the GP GTP group, 
it's pretty much all people you're passing, you know, and a few cars you got to deal with around you from your group. But yeah, but but that's what you learn. The, like I said, the GTO cars, I think, are some of the toughest. The middle class cars are the toughest because you're constantly trying to be aware of what's in front of you and behind you. And it's almost like you never have enough time to really see all of that and be trying to address how you're dealing with the track and how you're racing and how much margin you got left and all that kind of stuff. Do you think it makes you a better driver driving that class? Oh, uh, no question. Because no question. Yeah. For those reasons. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I never thought about that. It makes totally total sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a really good point. Um, you, ha you have anything else, Scott? I don't. I just, uh, man, I just love listening to Pete tell his stories and talk about <laughs> racing, man. Oh, I was yeah, no, so lucky to get to do that stuff. I, I was just so fortunate. And, and, and to get to me, it was, it was really special when I finally was able to start to connect up with, because I knew the value of the technology and having engineers with you that could focus exclusively on trying to make the card better and trying to utilize your input to optimize the car for the tracks and stuff. I really enjoyed getting to do that eventually when I got with better teams. You know, as I, when I'm running my own car, or even the early cars like the Mazda, the Mazda that I drove in 83 that we won the first 24 hour GTO with, and we actually finished third overall, I think in that race with that GTO car, which was very competitive, but it was just a, the guy built a really durable car that just kept running. and. And back in those days, that was a major asset because all the cars had problems usually. Right. But, but that was a real treat to get to work with somebody that was that thorough and, and really optimize the car and listen to the driver's input to try and improve things that would help us go faster or, or be safer when we were going fast to keep it on the track. You know, all that stuff. That was a real treat. Absolutely. Now, do you ever... Do you ever put the watch on to watch the race? I never got a watch. Rolex was never involved when I was. Oh there. man, that's right. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. I'm jealous. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> no. Oh, you ought to be. No, but they need to like go no back watch. and give the. <laughs> they need to go back and give the. You know, kind of like they did with the the Borg Warner Scott with you know before uh, they did the the mini Borgs where they went back and they yeah they need to do that but I'm, I'm guessing it would be a lot more expensive for them because there's a lot more drivers yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> maybe fake Rolexes yeah I used to tease I used to tease uh, P J Jones oh I, yeah I'd tease him and I would uh, during the twenty four hour I'd ask him if he had his Rolex on he's watching. <laughs> Real nice, real nice. <laughs> nah, hey, every year has its pluses and minuses, you know, what the heck. I was thankful that they were having, I came from the era of amateur racing where there really was no pro road racing. John, right. or John Bishop was just starting IMSA when I started amateur racing. Mm -hmm. And I was so thankful that he was starting a professional area for guys to look forward to possibly making it as a career down the road. And thankfully that worked out for me after 10 years of amateur racing, his IMSA was getting to the point where there's starting to be a few positions in pro racing for drivers in road racing. As the manufacturers came in, Ford came in, Chevrolet, some of that kind of stuff, Mazda, yeah. I was so fortunate. I was happy not to have a watch. I didn't care. <laughs> <laughs> when was your last 24-hour race? I think, it, I think it must have been right around... Uh, I don't think I ran... I ran in 89, won in 89 mm -hmm. with Roush, then went to Mazda, ran there a couple of years with Mazda, in the GTO, G GTP car and GTO. And then after Mazda closed their program down, I, I went to BMW and drove for Tom Milner and the BMW people for a few years. But I don't know if, I don't think we ran the 24 hour race in those cars in that, 
I don't remember that, to be honest. You know, right. I'd have to go back and look in the records books. And see. <laughs> I didn't win it then. So. The, um, the, I was, I was just showing my girlfriend some videos from YouTube of you doing, um, it was Trans Am. That was just like 10 years ago, right? So you were racing Trans Am. Yeah. Um, just up to, it was like 2012, yeah, I, I think was the last year or something like that. 12 and 13, I, uh, okay. a friend of mine, Mike Miller, was a part owner in Trans Am and a group of owners that was trying to get Trans Am going again. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to come back and help him uh, try and sort those cars out. He had a team and a couple of cars. And so I enjoyed doing that. And he's a really nice guy. And I enjoyed working with him and just helping him out. And then we started getting close to the first race and, and we felt pretty good. It seemed like the cars were going pretty good. He said, well, why don't you come to the first race and run the first race with me? I said, I don't know. But I did, and, and we won the first race. So then he says, oh, well, you can't stop now. All right. <laughs> so, so I had fun. I won a few races and finished second in the series that year oh. in the TA2 class. And it, and it was really fun. It was a fun team. It was fun racing. It's competitive, uh, close racing. But I realized, you know, I just, I felt, it's funny, you know, you know, you realize when I'm out there on the track, I'm trying to decide how, how fast do I really want to go in this fast corner. And I'm thinking about, I'm not so worried about myself, but because the, car, the cars have gotten pretty safe in these days. But right. I was worried about tearing a car up for the guys that work on it and, and all the work then they have to do if I wrap it up, you know. And so I just, and that kept me from going fast. And I said, this is stupid. I'm not going to go as fast as like, as, as the young guys can and, and as, or as I could have when I wasn't thinking about that and worried about it. And uh, so I said, oh, okay, I, I don't need to keep doing this, but I really enjoyed helping Cam Lawrence, uh, who was coming up as a racer back then mm -hmm. and is really a, a first rate road racer. And I, he's gotten some good rides and shown some real promise. And I kind of mentored him the next year with Mike Miller in those cars. And then, uh, and then Mike decided he was going to do something else and he sold the team. And so that was the last pro racing I did. Yeah. I know a, um, I know a professional driver that drove, <clears throat> he drove in champ cars. His name was Speedy Dan Clark, but he didn't have any rides. And he's like, he joined some like poor sports car series. And it was mostly like um, gentlemen racers. And he basically just swept the whole, I mean, a, you know, professional drivers, gentlemen racers. I mean, there's no competition. He was breaking yeah. like, you know, yeah. the records with the cars and stuff. And they basically told him he wasn't allowed to come back. The series. <laughs> oh, and a bunch of weenies. <laughs> At least some of those guys ought to recognize the value of having a good guy come. Yeah, absolutely. And learn something from them. Don't try and get rid of the guy. Right. I mean, but, but, you know, but that's the way some people are, you know, like, who am I to tell them how to run their series? <laughs> <laughs> but right. that's how i tried to look at it and i can yeah. understand you know if uh if somebody really good comes into the racing you're doing if you're a pro you you feel like they're taking the food off of your table but but if you're right. a pro you better figure out how to go as fast as they are or not much of a pro i mean it gets serious i mean <laughs> right well now they have all the um, rules with um with like sports car racing where you have to have like different level rated drivers yeah, in your car or whatever. That's really goofy. They have the different, yeah. different licenses for different experience levels of people and stuff. It's really gotten way too complicated. Yeah. You know, I really did enjoy it more when it was, and I, I was never involved in it when it was, when, when it's become that way. I've seen that recently, yeah. but uh, I just really enjoyed it when it was just, you know, you bring a car, is who's going to go the fastest. You don't have all these rules about run this tire, run that tire, can't run more than this many hours or that many hours, all these. The more rules they make, the less racing it really is. All right, that I can absolutely agree with right there. Crazy, crazy. Well, Pete, we, we, uh, uh, my age. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we really appreciate, I was going to say, we really appreciate your time. And um, oh. like I said earlier, thanks for always talking to hey. us. You're very welcome. Thank, you, Thank you guys. Thank you guys for supporting situations that that helps racers. Some racers make a living in the in this sport, 
and I was so fortunate to be around it and be able to do that. I'm, I'm always thankful for that. Absolutely. Well, you guys take care and good luck with what you're doing. It looks Thanks. like you guys are. Uh, so what, when are you going to make your first million and get a Rolex for uh, putting out these podcasts? Scott's, still, Scott's kind of been working on that for a while. <laughs> Way before time. I was even born. Way before I was even born. Yeah, I'm, if, we're, if we're waiting for me to make a million, we're going to be waiting a long time. <laughs> well, we need we need to find ways for you guys to up your game a little bit. Find some good sponsors for your game, podcast stuff and all that stuff. We've been, we've been working well, on some stuff like that. We're trying we've to get been working into, on some stuff. We're trying to Good. do more like um video. We're trying to come up with some ideas to do some like video stuff too, kind of outside of the podcast stuff. Well, that's exactly what racing is about. Yep. You know, there's no there's no bachelor's degrees and stuff like that you can get at it. You got to go figure out how are you going to make a living and how does this how does this sport or whatever you call it operate. Where can I find a niche that I can actually make a living doing something I enjoy and I won't really be calling it work at least some of the time. <laughs> That's right. Right. It's funny because I know people, uh, me and Scott both have day jobs. So this is not, we don't oh, make okay. a living or anything yeah. like that. Um, we both yeah. have really good jobs, but I know a couple of people you. who are like professional YouTubers um, and that's just oh, yeah. too risky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's kind of like trying to be a, trying to be a race driver back Absolutely. in the 70s <laughs> and make a living. Absolutely it is. <laughs> Unless your name was Very... Andretti or Unser or something like that, then that helped a little. <laughs> Absolutely. Not all of them. Not all of them. It didn't help them all. That's right. That's right. It's it's a very and that's one of the neat parts about the sport. It's very unforgiving. If you're not able to do it, you probably aren't going to do it very long. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. It's Your name will only take you so far. Very immediate return. You find out real quick how good you are. And a lot of times I you agree. find out you don't just, just don't have the money to show how good you are, but but that's part of it. Yeah. yeah. All you right. You guys take care. All right. Thanks, Pete. Well, Pete, anytime. Thank you very it's much. always a pleasure. Thank you, Pete. Thank you very much. Take care.